Thanks, Zane. Okay, well, if it's already recording, I better get started then. Um, all right, so this evening we are running through a bit of a mooding 101 for all of those who are going to be doing the junior moot or thinking of doing the junior moot. Um, this evening we have a really exciting problem. It's based on criminal law, um, whereas previous years it's been um, taught and contract, so it's a little bit different this year, which is really exciting. Um, so if we're going to, I hope this is working, I'm going to start running through stuff so the basics um so it's a mock appellate um court it's an appeal you have judges counsel um yourselves being the counsel um and you're appealing a previous decision so has everyone here mooted before everyone feel it everyone sort of familiar with how it all works well i'll go through this anyway simply for the people who will probably be listening to the recording a bit later um, so you'll be an appellant um, and respondent the appellant will go first the respondent will go second it will be uh, senior junior for the um, appellant side and then senior junior for the respondent side um, there's no difference between senior and junior it's really just the order um, that you're speaking you divide the time between yourself so if you get 20 minutes per team you might decide your senior gets 12 because they need that um, extra time your junior might get um, my maths probably be terrible. Eight, and then you might reserve one minute for rebuttal or two minutes for rebuttal. Um, so, because it's um, appellate, or because it's an appeal, it's questions of law only. So, you're not appealing fact, and that's because the trial judge had the advantage of um, looking at all those facts and the evidence in the first decision. Now, you're appealing on questions of law. So, don't argue with facts that are there, black and white. If there's um, so you'll use the facts that you've been given to formulate your responses and your submissions, um, but you're not um, making leaps from those facts that aren't there and making assumptions because you'll be asked, are you leading, leading evidence from the bar table um, counsel? So for example, if a judge makes a finding that, for example, one of the parties suffers from PTSD, you can't dispute whether that party actually suffers PTSD. Um, so you don't rely on um, making up stuff that benefits your case, but when it's in saying that there will be circumstances where you can make reasonable inferences. So for example, um, a man jumps out of a window of a 30 story building. It's reasonable to infer that that's quite a long way to fall. Um, written submissions. So I believe it's usually the same, but always check your rules. If you do enter, check the rules um, due the day before your round at 12 p.m. Um, points are usually deducted if you are late. Um, what happens then uh, when you, uh, so at the start of the moot, we do appearances. Has anyone seen or done appearances before? For the benefit of those listening, an appearance is when um, the judge will ask, we'll take appearances, please. Your senior will rise and say, Your Honour, may it please the court. My name is Driscoll, D-R-I-S-C-O-L-L, -L, initials H-S. I appear on behalf of the appellant. Um, I appear with my learned junior, Miss Faulkner, F-A-L-K-N-E-R, initials L. Um, I will be speaking to Ken and Ms. Falkner for nine. We reserve one minute for rebuttal. Then you will sit down. Your respondent team will get up and do the exact same thing. Then the judge will invite um, the senior from the um, appellant to speak. Um, judges tend, um, judges will always ask your quest ask questions, and that's when uh, your, that's your chance to to shine. And then at the end of the moot you'll leave the room while the judges deliberate. But that's basically like the rough outline. So we'll go into it a little bit more. Um, this is not gonna be the exact criteria sheet that you would be marked on, but this is an example, a good example to look at. So um, you, you think about it when you're, when you're submitting and you're organizing your material, think about um, these criteria. So is it effective? 
does it have um, a conclusion? Is it logical? Are you flexible to the needs of the bench? So when the bench asks you a question, even though you're not quite on that point, are you able to then go to that point and do that? Are you persuasive? Be a little bit passionate, but not like dramatically passionate because, you know, real, realistically the circumstance might not be something to be overly passionate about, but you still care about your clients. So be earnest. I think that's really important. Some people just speak like a zombie um, and they're just reciting whatever they want to do but you'll kind of go care about your client in the background um, act, act to a certain extent I guess like like you're really in court and um, this person's gonna pay you and ask for answers later um, questions from the bench uh, you've got to respond clearly effective integration of arguments into your answers now that's really 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 important um, I think the most ideal thing is lots and lots of questions from the bench and then you use those questions to, in, uh, to integrate your submissions into them. You already have your submissions there. And if you can answer the bench's questions with your submissions, then you're not wasting any time and you'll sound like you know exactly what you're talking about and you're giving really, really persuasive answers. Um, speaking um, with, uh, dealing with intervention with ease, skills and confidence, welcome those questions from the judges there to be welcomed. They're your chance to shine. It's a conversation, not a presentation. That's really, really important because you're there to assist the bench to understand your submissions and guide them through your arguments. So you run it. You be flexible to their needs, but guide them back to the main point where necessary. Does that make sense? So it's a skill. It can be a little bit tricky to... To master because you're in control of your submissions but at the same time it's sort of like ironic because you've got to um, uh, woo, woo the bench so to speak when they ask you questions they ask you something over that's somewhere later on in your submissions you've got your honor um, I, um, I will turn to that later in my submissions however I'm quite happy to address that briefly now for you and most likely the court will say yes briefly address it, answer their question, and then you'll get to it and flesh it out a lot later in your submission. And you'll even bring up the fact that um, the court asked a question about that. And that's I received really, really positively from the bench. Uh, your written outline, um, clear, correct citations. Citations are important and know your citations when you go up there. So know your cases. If the court will always ask you, especially in junior moot, where, uh, where does that decision come from? And if you don't know, then it looks pretty poor on your part because that could either be a, um, that could be a, a New South Wales Court of Appeal decision. If it's a Queensland Court of Appeal decision, even better, a high court decision. It can really um, make your argument stronger or weaker and particularly weaker if you don't know where that case comes from. Um, you want it logical and easy to follow. Um, and we'll show you an example of what some written submissions might look like in a moment. Um, oh, so again, we've done that. Um, organizing your material. So it can be very useful to think of these things when you're organizing your material. So um, if there is a case that's factually similar, and then depending on um, what party you are, you may want to say that the legal reasoning should apply because the facts are the same or find a way to distinguish those facts. So you'll get three or four cases probably in um, the problem. Read those cases, find how they help you and then find where they don't help you and distinguish, um, distinguish that case. Does that make sense? <coughs> um, so you're comparing and distinguishing and always again using the most authoritative case. The higher in the court hierarchy, the better. Um, and if it's not so authoritative, bring the analogy in really, really strong. I think that's the best way to do that. And at the end of it, always link it back to the current situation. Why does it help you? Your Honour, um, Senior Counsel, what happened in this case? Well, blah, 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 blah. And this helps us here because blah, 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 blah. So always bring it back. Um, that's really, really important. So don't just cite legal authority because then it might not mean anything. Always make it really crystal clear why you're saying that. Um, so we're going a little bit more into the appellants um, and the kind of cross appeal thing. Um, the appellants will be saying why the preliminary judge's decision was incorrect. And then the respondents will be supporting the pre preliminary judge's decision 
Um, and sometimes there might be a cross appeal where the respondents will also be appealing um, one part of the decision of the preliminary judge. Does everyone sort of understand that? So they might be disagreeing with one of the decisions um, that the preliminary judge held, but they're the respondent because they've appealed it second. Does that sort of, it can be difficult to understand, um, but once, when you get the problem, it'll be easier to see what you're, what you're looking at. Um, written submissions. So this is an example, only an example of a good way you might like to structure your written submissions. So it will usually be two pages. You'll be given two pages and um, one page for authorities. Um, now, do you see how we've got that big heading here? Um, and then we've got um, a subheading and then we've got a couple of sub points proving that. That's probably for my liking, maybe just a little bit too detailed, but um, you would narrow it right down. And what that is, it's a skeleton of your argument and the court has that, your opponents have that, and then you flesh it out um, when you're submitting and when you're presenting your submissions. Um, you're telling them what you're gonna be talking about and then you're explaining it. You don't have all your answers and your whole game plan, so to speak, right there. Um, for your opponents and for the bench to see because it's a conversation you don't want to be giving them a script you want to be telling them what you're going to be talking to them about but like a a bit it's, it's basically like a brief of what your arguments are going to be and then you're going to explain them so that's just one way you might like to set out your submissions you'll generally be told i think it's which supreme court direction is it to set it out in usually i'm not sure if is anyone familiar with court documents or anything so um there's a they might tell you uh, to do your written submissions in the form of um, and according with a certain practice direction. So practice directions are basically, that's a practice directions that um, practitioners use all the time. Um, there'll be, there's one for the Supreme Court, there's one for the District Court, and there's one for every single possible thing you can think of in litigation. And it's basically a guide for those in practice on how to do something um, whether it be to apply to a QCAT or whether it be um, an ethical dilemma. So there'll be a practice direction that they'll tell you to put your submissions in the form in. So that will help you um, put it in the right format. Um, speaking, ability and delivery. I think this is the most important slide and I always go over this in Moot Club because you've got to be conversational. You've got a signpost. Your Honours, at the start, I will be addressing uh, point um, appeal grounds one and two, say what they are. My learner junior will be addressing grounds three and four. Um, tonight, I, in grounds one and two, I will be addressing, and then these are my three submissions, bang, 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 and then stick to that structure with that flexibility to the bench. And after you've answered any judges' questions that go elsewhere, you come back to that originally. Um, so that's really important to always make it clear where you're going and where you are in your submissions. Every now and then if you draw the judge's attention to um, point 1.3 of our written submissions, that shows the judge where you are, what you're arguing. So no one goes off track and everyone understands where everyone is and it makes such a big difference. Minimal hand gestures. I'm a bit of a hand gesture person. I'm really, uh, I, I, so what I do um, when I'm at the lectern is I'll usually rest my hands on it and then you use them as appropriate. So when it feels natural to do it, don't force it, but obviously don't wave your hands around. A lot of people have a tendency to accidentally take a pen up with them, which is like you don't really notice that you're doing it and then they'll often stand at the lectern and kind of like wave their hands around with a pen and it's a really, really bad look. Um, there's even some people, you know, that you don't even notice, cookie pens, they're standing up there clicking. And it's really, as you can imagine, really bad, but you don't notice in that moment. So hand gestures, I think, are really, really good, but use them appropriately. Um, another really important thing, being clear and precise. So legal ease is dead and dying. Don't use unnecessary, complicated legal language. Um, we don't need long, long quotes from cases. Um, paraphrase them, make them simple. What is the principle of it? Unless it's obviously a really, really important quote and you need it word for word, but um, try and keep it clear. Um, the simpler the argument, um, the more persuasive it is. So if you just spell it out, it has to be so clear in a way that no one could argue with it. 
So um, I'm trying to think of a good example. I'm really bad at thinking about examples right on the spot. But <laughs> basically, if you can just make your arg argument as minimal and clear as possible, and then the judges will intervene with questions, and then you can flesh that out a little bit more for them. Um, submitting rather than thinking. You always submit, and you've probably all heard this before. No one cares what you think or feel or believe. You always submit. Your honours, I submit. If they ask you a question, we submit. The appellant submits. You never go, Your Honour, I think in that situation, no. It's always I submit. So recalibrate yourself, eradicate any thinking, believing. If you say submit in everyday life, that's even better. Just in moot court, never say, never say anything else. Um, being respectful to the bench. So be assertive because they're your submissions, but there's a really fine line between crossing over to being kind of... Um, uh, peeved off by the bench's relentless questioning and being condescending to the bench. So they can ask you some really stupid questions because they haven't spent the time on these submissions that you have. They haven't um, gone through all the cases. They haven't, you know, spent days and hours tabbing this and highlighting this and looking up this. Um, so they might ask you a question that's really, really left field and strange. Indulge them and then say, Your Honour, um, but however, the relevant point here is this. Um, make sure with your tone, some people don't mean to, but they do tend to end up coming across quite forceful and sassy. I've been called um, sassy and bossy many times by the bench. Um, and it's just about finding um, that right tone where you're in control, you're authoritative, but you're respectful to the bench. Um, so that's really, really important. Um, Oh, especially when on the other side is speaking, if they're saying something absolutely preposterous, like keep a straight face, don't like shake your head or, um, I don't know, tisk or whatever. Um, even furiously writing, don't be like, oh, just furiously, don't, don't do that. Um, very, very calm, just write a little note because you can get them later in rebuttal if it's really, really horrendous. Um, so that's really important. Your bench manner is looked at very much. So um, this is what I was saying a little bit before because you're running the submissions, the judges are only intervening with questions. So you welcome questions from the bench. Yes, Your Honour, ask me questions. Awkward benches are really quiet because you don't know if you're saying anything interesting or if they're even listening. So if they're asking questions, it's good. If they're asking lots of questions, it's because they think that you can handle it. It's not because you're saying something terrible. Um, most of the time, um, a lot of people don't, aren't listening to the questions to the bench and they'll um, quickly start, they'll stress out because they'll black out when they hear the question. They're like, oh my God, a question's coming at me. I don't know what to say. And then they've missed the question. So take a moment to actually listen to the question. Sometimes they can be helping you. So sometimes they might be asking you to clarify something that's actually beneficial to you and they might be throwing you a lifeline. So make sure you're listening out for, for those lifelines. I'll get you in a second. Make sure you're listening out um, for those lifelines um, and take them because if you miss them, then it's sort of, you know, well, they weren't listening to me at all. So if you, you got to answer the judge's question, that's really, really important. And when answering the judge's questions, it's okay to take a moment and listen to it. The judges will in fact love it if you take a moment and be deep in thought and ponder their very intelligent question. So if you do that, most of them will feel quite, you know, quite, quite clever. So do that, but also at the same time, start thinking of, think about your answer before you say it. I had a very bad habit of immediately wanting to jump in and answer their honest question because if I didn't, that meant I didn't know the answer. And what I would do is I would talk for about 30 seconds around and around and around until it came to me and then I would eventually come up with something coherent. Um, that's not good because the first 30 seconds of what I was saying was ridiculous and not relevant because I was thinking about what the judges were saying. So it's actually really important that you start off answering the question and not just talking about something random to fill time. So take a pause. The pause seems long to you, but it's perfectly fine. Um, so you had a question? Um, it's just more about like questions and like mm -hmm. trying to time yourself for the time that you have. Yeah. Like, how do you work out exactly how much time you should speak in comparison to, like, how many questions you're going to be asked? Because I know, like, last time was my first time. Yeah. And I was under time. And I thought that I would have heaps of time. And I ended up going over time. That's what happens. Exactly. So, like, 
how do you like juggle that? Look, I guess that comes back to making your arguments simple. I would say, and then um, because you know you're going to get lots of questions. So when um, you mooted, um, Laura and I asked you lots of questions because you were able to answer them, and that was fine. So no, but you were you were able to answer them, um, and you will always go over time. Judges will they know that you're taking up your time? It's tricky. So I would have. I would have all my submissions ready to go. So you'd have them ready to go. Um, and you'd accept the fact that you're not going to get through all of them. You would have, when you, if someone says five minutes to go and you're only one third of the way through, start thinking how I can summarize my entire moot in one minute. Actually, you should practice this beforehand. Mm -hmm. How can I summarize my moot in a minute? If someone said to me, hey, um, hey Ryan, can you um, tell me what's your entire argument about? What's all your submissions? What's it all about? What's your argument? And then if Ryan could summarize that, that for me in one minute, um, then that's excellent. Uh, so practice that because you'll get a period of time when they'll say two minutes to go. Um, don't use that as an opportunity to keep continuing on the exact same submissions that you're on. Think about what you need and what's most important and what you need to tell the court um, and go straight to that. Does that make sense? So do you have sort of like almost like two alternative speeches ready? No, because you shouldn't have a speech. You should only have dot points of your arguments. <laughs> yes, you should only have dot points of your arguments. If I, if there was a moot, what, you've got to think, what is my most, what is my strongest argument? Um, what do I need to get out? And start, I suppose, that comes with practice as well. So you start filtering automatically when I get to be told or, you know, four minutes to go, five minutes to go, I'd immediately go, okay, because I practiced it so much, I practiced this conversation, had questions thrown at me, I would be like, okay, immediately, that's not that important, that's not that important, that's not that important, I'm going to move to that. Your Honours, I refer you to my written submissions for points, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to address this um, in, um, given that there is this much time left and go to it and that's fine. They'll be able to appreciate that you're able to discern the most important stuff. So being able to discern what the most important stuff is and go straight to it um, is really, really good. And then again, incorporating your answers, uh, your submissions into your answers will help with that. It is difficult. Um, it's very, very, very unusual to get through all your submissions. It just is very, very rare. So you've got to accept that from the start. Um, ready to summarize your second submission in one minute. Ready to summarize your third submission in one minute. So if necessary, you can pick out the most important points and just whack them out and then refer the bench to your written submissions um, for the rest of their argument. And if they want to know about them, they'll ask you to do it. There's no harm in asking for a time extension. Time extensions are 99% of the time asked for. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Your Honour, I know my time has expired. May I please have an extra two minutes to um, summarise my team's submissions? Um, don't continue on where you were. Go to your strongest point and then maybe tie up something because if they want to know about something, they'll ask you about them. Does that help? It is tricky and you'll get to see what I mean when you actually do it. Um, but being able to pick out what's most important and what's going to win what's going to win your case so you, that's what you've got to get across um so um when you're preparing for moot 80 percent of it is research and reading the cases uh i the cases are really cool <laughs> especially when you get ones given to you um one thing that i used to do would be reading the cases from back to front and i would highlight everything that helped me and i would sticky note it this is just a personal thing. And then I'd stick it all in a Word document and then I'd start looking at that and start formulating those principles about how they're going to win me said argument or, you know, help me with uh, this ground of appeal. Um, so if you're knowing the cases really, really well, that's, I think that's the biggest criteria um, apart from answering questions and being able to explain the cases in two to three lines, two to three line summaries of the cases and then why it's relevant to you and then why it helps you or why it doesn't help you and why it's different. Um, so that's really, really important. Um, textbooks are very useful for getting that background reading, uh, that background understanding, especially if it's an area of law you're not sure of. Has everyone done criminal law? 
oh, that's, it'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, the good thing about criminal law is that like, it's very element based. So, and then there's the like, cases sort of expanding on it, but mainly with criminal law and for those who have sort of studied it, probably noticed that, you know, there's like this elements to this offense and, you know, to a certain extent, um, it's a bit tricky to go wrong. Um, formulating and writing the cases. Um, so writing your submissions, probably a smaller part of it, but at the same time, you want to make sure those submissions are really, really stellar and on point, clear, persuasive, and not pages and pages of, of um, just of text. Um, make sure you read the rules, what you can do, what you can't do, make sure you know that. Um, read the score sheet. I don't think we give them the score sheet though beforehand though, so disregard that one, guys. Disregard the score sheet. <laughs> Um, so read the problem. When you re first read the problem, you're going to read it several times. First time you're going to be like, oh wow, there's lots of pages and stuff and there's probably like attachments and um, bits of exhibits and you're like, wow, this is so overwhelming and there's so many things. But that's fine. So read through it. Then go through it again a second time with a highlighter. Start highlighting key stuff. Helps to sometimes put together chronology. Maybe um, you won't need it so much for this one because it's a junior moot, but for the bigger moots, helps put together a chronology of everything because sometimes you have like um, your memorial is like 35 pages and that's not including exhibits and it's ridiculous. Um, make sure you know which jurisdiction it is. It'll be the Queensland Court of Appeal. Um, but don't hold me to that, but 99% of the time it is. Um, and it's a previous decision of the matter. And then you start your research. Reading the cases, I think, is the best way to start. Or in your case, because it's crim, you'll go to the section, um, go to the cases that they give you, and carters, as probably everyone's got carters somewhere hovering around, or maybe an old version, if you go to that section, um, wherever it will be in the criminal code, they'll all have all the cases there, which I'm sure will be very beneficial. Um, we've gone through all of that. Oh yeah, see cases, most mooting argumentation. That's where you get most of your stuff. Um, ideas um, when you are somewhat running out of arguments. Not that you will run out, um, not that you will uh, uh, run short on time for your submissions because you will always go over because everyone's asking questions. Um, but if you're out of ideas, it's floodgate arguments. So um, if we allow this decision, um, what other precedents are going to um, stem from this? Uh, yeah, so if we um, allow this person to go free or we let this person off, what does this mean for every other case and every other analog analogous case that's going to come through the court? Um, the doctrine of precedent case, um, the doctrine of precedent argument. So this is what the High Court of Australia found. We must follow it. Um, otherwise, you know, we're, we're going, we're, we're breaking the laws, <laughs> the common law, um, the ratio of the dissenting judges, that's always good. So, um, the high court might've found something, but the dissenting judges might have arguments in there that really help, um, your case. So you might be able to read those dissenting judgments and see, um, what they thought and be like, wow, that, that's really actually quite clever. That's useful. And bring that into your own submissions. Um, because those judges are still very learned, they're there for a reason. They just disagree. Um, I actually don't know what, I don't remember what the dead cat one is. Laura, would you mind explaining what the dead cat one is? It's like when you know that you've got an argument that's against you, and yeah. when you know that something is against you, and so you put your dead cat on the table. Uh, so what you're, what you're doing is you're saying, like, yeah. your honours, I understand that this is against me, but and then you bring in your argument instead of trying to skirt around this clear point which is against you. Yeah, so um, it's yeah best to be like, yeah, I know this is our weak point, like this is this is really bad. Um, and just, be, you're honest, that's the highest I can put it. The judge will probably screw up their face and be like, really? I mean, I'm not with you on that point. Um, maybe press it for a little bit, and um, but then know when the bench isn't liking it, say, so your honours, that's the highest I can put that argument and just move on. They'll accept that. Um, unless, and then there are circumstances when it's clearly um, ridiculously plainly wrong and it is good to concede. Um, I'm, I'm always reluctant to concede, but when you do concede an argument, don't do it easily, but do it when it's so clearly wrong that you're literally like arguing falsity or like something that's not even law. Um, and when you do that, 
identify to the, um, tell the court, yes, Your Honour, we can, yes, we can see that argument. However, we don't need it because our point, our submission one stands. Our submission one will still win this ground of appeal. So take the court back to the, the point that's going to overall help you. Um, equitable justice is um, similar to the floodgate. So how will this undermine someone's right if we um, find this way today? Um, won't be a, no, won't be a, I don't, it won't be a closed case list. Some of the stuff, um, you'll get, yeah, three or four cases. Make sure you address the cases that they give you. So talk about them. They're there because they want you to talk about them and then everything else is extra. Um, oh yeah, we're not, Laura and I aren't the competitions team. So we're the moot club. Um, so if you have questions about the problem itself, um, like what's, what's in this or what does this mean? Or I think there's might be a typo here, um, direct them to the competitions team um, because we can't help you. We can help you with legal principle, but we can't give you the answers either. So if you uh, have a general moot question um, about how would I do this, um, you can ask us that, but don't be like a paragraph four of the, of the facts. Um, I'm not sure if this means that so-and-so like stabbed this person or whether they saw them or not. Like, I don't know that so we can't ask, we can't answer that for you. So um, yeah, where we can help you with um, just uh, mooting, general mooting questions. Um, section 20 of the rules. So the rules that you'll get addresses withdrawals. Um, we ask that you really don't withdraw because one, it's not fair on the other side. Two, it stuffs the draw up massively. Um, and through, it just, it just, um, it, it just creates a bit of kerfuffle for everyone, um, really. And once you've signed up, you should really commit to it regardless of whether you're, you feel like you're ready or not. Give it a go. Nothing's going to go wrong. Um, it's fine. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to learn any other way. So if you're not feeling com confident, still go and give it a crack. There's no harm in it. Um, most of your cases will be in your student materials. So again, for crim law might be there. Um, you'll be able to find it in like the library book. Um, um, they're not going to give you being a junior moot and the first time we run the criminal uh, law moot, anything um, abstract or obscure or crazy. Um, competition logistics. So registrations are open now. Um, so you register online. Then you'll get an initial draw. So they'll tell you when you're going to be. And I believe it's going to start end of next week, preliminary rounds. Um, and then um, the point system, um, essentially, if you lose your, some judges might announce a winner because we have external judges come in. Um, some might choose to announce a winner. Some might not announce a winner. If a winner's announced, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're out of the competition or not because it's points based. Um, it really depends on how many teams that we end up having registered as to how many teams will actually go through to the semi-finals. Um, don't be discouraged if you don't progress to the next round. And that's because there's so, so many teams in the competition. We just have to do a bit of a cull. Um, and that doesn't really mean anything um, at all for your skill level. It, it's, it's just... It's, it's, it's just a thing. Unfortunately, we can't have more than, more than you know, three or four rounds. Um, so if you get the, get the opportunity to progress, that's brilliant. Congratulations. But don't be hard on yourself if you don't because um, it, it's difficult because there's, there's so many teams. Um, and I encourage you to keep, keep going and not be, um, not be discouraged in any way if you don't make it through the next round. So where mooting leads. Um, I always do this slide at everything um, just because I think it's really important that, um, you know, there's, there's so much to mooting. So we have like the junior moot, the senior moot, there's the first year law moot. Um, we have, um, well, we've got the criminal law one now happening. There's um, the International Criminal Court internal moot. Uh, we have so, we have other we have the client interview competition as well the negotiation competition so there's many many internal competitions that you can enter um, and then you get an opportunity um, to also compete externally and that's when you do an audition for a team the QUT Torts Moot the Kirby Moot Jessup Oxford Biz ICC and there are opportunities to travel um, and you know prepare over many 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 months and you get very very good at moving very quickly and you also make some great great friends and it basically becomes your life um, and it's a good life <laughs> so you, but it is a lot of fun and it's the best fun that I've ever had at uni so does anyone have any questions after I've eat, bitten everyone's ear off with my words don't be shy
What would be Helen your biggest piece of advice in preparing for the um, my biggest piece of advice for preparing for the MOOC. Um, in preparation wise, I think I, I said it earlier, but I think it would be um, reading the cases that they give you and going through and knowing them really well and highlighting what helps you and seeing what doesn't help you and point, figuring out um, why um, it's different from, from your circumstance um, and why it shouldn't be taken into account. In preparation, I think that's what it is. The other thing in preparation is constantly berating your moot partner with questions. Um, whether you be on the bus, in a coffee shop, walking beside each other randomly, we were talking about something completely different and just like throw a question at, it, throw a question at them. Um, and that's how um, you get really good at answering the questions on the spot. Um, practice, practice, practice with questions. Um, sit across from each other, mood at each other, and just constantly be a really interventional, uh, interventional judge, just hammering, 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 going so ridiculous. And that way you're so prepared that whatever the judges come at you with, um, you've most likely heard every single ridiculous question under the sun. So I think those two, for me um, particularly, um, was just hammering, hammering, hammering with the questions with each other. And what that meant is that I wasn't scripted. Um, I was able to rephrase um, my arguments in 25,000 different ways. Um, my partner would be like, oh, um, what's um, submission 2.3 in 45 seconds? Um, that was things like really, really, really long routes and things like that. And you'd have to, I'd be able, need to be able to summarise it because... Um, when you only had certain period, certain periods of time left, you need to be able to um, address it and and put put articulate it in a way that was really really strong and decisive um, in a short period of time. So, yeah. Question. Yes. What are typical questions that you get? Um, for well, in junior mood, it will be thing. There'll be lots of doctrine of priests and stuff. There'll be things like, "What's that case about?" Um, <sighs> Being in the criminal law, now because this is a crim moot, I think you'll be getting um, questions, I don't want to say too much because I don't, I know what, I've read the problem. It'll be, it'll be question, it'll be, I think you'll be getting a lot of factual cases, cases that will help um, prove or disprove the elements of the certain offence. I think that's what you'll be getting, I think that's what you'll be getting. Um, I would say they'd be very well known cases for that particular offence. Um, I think that's what mainly for this purpose, not like, so unlike other moots where it might, you might be asked about, um, you know, things like false imprisonment and whether there really was, um, you know, fear and different things like that. For crim, I think uh, for these particular offences, I think it'll be pretty clear cut and very very fact-based with your facts and then also um, cases um, that are able to be um, analog analogous to that, I think. What do you think, Laura? I just think that there's no way to actually know what the people are going to get because yeah. those judges are clever people and they will come up with That's true. questions that you've never heard of. Hmm. You'll be able to think of the questions when you're practising with each other as well. You'll see what's relevant. Yeah. Do you think it's better to stick with like one moot partner or to like switch around? I had the same moot partner for four years before she ran away and got married, um, <laughs> which was really sad for me. She's like my best friend. And then I had um, another moot partner for another four moots. I think... To me, it, this is only a personal opinion. I think it's really, really good to have different root partners, but at the same time, having the same one over and over again meant that we knew each other's styles. It was an automatic split when we got a problem. She's like, all right, you read the first four cases, I'm reading the, the next four, we'll do this. It was automatically this, and we knew each other's style. There was no problem, we were a team. Um, so we were just able to talk to each other. And when you know someone really, really well, is you've got no problem floating around ideas. Do you know what I mean? There's no awkwardness. Um, not that there would be awkwardness, but I, I don't know. Just for me personally, I really enjoyed staying with the with the same moot partner um, because you got to know each other's styles, each other's strengths and weaknesses and help each other out. Um, it's different when you go into a bigger team for an external moot and there's like four of you. Um, but again, you work with each other so intently, like... You know, you might you all sit around wearing snuggies at three a.m. in the morning in the law library. Like it's it's very intimate. Um, so you get to know each other very well that way as well. But um, you know, I, I personally really like staying with the same moot partner. But at the same time, it's also it can be beneficial to switch it up every now and then. Yeah, I think it's just a personal preference, isn't it? Yeah, but you want someone who's obviously really passionate and wants to like 
So the good thing about my movement partner is that we were like moot or die. So it was like, we really, really cared and put 110% effort in. So, yeah. Um, in all of this, I've done the ACC one, and it was 10 minutes, and the ACC one was 25. Yeah. Yeah. Could you give us any indications for what this Oh, I reckon it'd be 20 minutes aside. 20, yeah. I reckon, I think. 10 minutes per, like 10 to 15 minutes per person. Yeah, 10 to 15 per so, person, yeah. But we can't get it. Yeah, can't get it, but it, it won't be, I wouldn't say you'd be speaking for 20 minutes each, I don't think. It's not like, it's not the external mode, just like 45 a person. <gasps> I was second respondent and I have to listen to two hours, 15 minutes of other submissions before I spoke and I was desperate for the bathroom. Like, can I just say, <laughs> it was so bad. I could not wait to go. <laughs> anyway, I wish they thought that was recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah. No, I don't think so. No, no, I know it. Yeah. Not quite. The reason why they gave you that is because ICC has three parties and it's a bit, it's very, very different. Um, it's a different setup, very different law, um, can be quite complex, um, but I, you won't get one of those, but you'll be told the Supreme Court practice direction, I'm fairly, fairly sure. Um, the other thing you can look at is on the QUT Law Society website, there's a um, mooting guide. And the mooting guide um, will have um, steps about how you can write your written submissions and all that kind of stuff. It's a really, really big document and it'll go through a lot of the stuff that I talked about tonight, etc. So, yeah. Yes? How brutal can the judges be, like, especially junior mate? Oh, I don't think they'll be brutal for the junior mate. They might be. It depends who it is. It can, every bench is different. I think that you're probably gonna like have nice judges for the prelim round, but the moment that you get to semi finals, they're like, now we need to find who's best, and they yeah. step it up a notch. Yeah. It's but they also, if they think you can, ha if you're speaking really confidently and they think you can handle it, they will ask you more questions and, and hammer you more. It might be more brutal. Um, it really depends. Like every bench is really different and especially they might be really nice and then mark you really harshly. So you never really know. Um, but I, it's all so subject, like benches can be subjective, but at this, you know, you just do your best and don't take to heart if you sit down and um, the worst thing you can do is sit down and like put your head in your hands and look crestfallen and think that you did really bad because you probably did really well. Um, just because you got hammered, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean much at all. It meant, meant that you could handle it. Um, hammering is good because you can, it's like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's like no chance for you to lull back into like some kind of rehearsed script. It's really, really good. Yep. Um, other than the six minute rule, is there any requirement as far as who speaks longest for the first and second? Um, as in like, would you thinking about like. So like, is there, does the senior council have to speak? No, so you can have it exactly, yeah, you can have it, you can split it however, however way you think is appropriate. You might think ground three needs a bit more, you might think ground one or two. Generally, I don't know, generally the senior council always tends to speak a little bit longer, but that's because they're doing an intro of your, the, the case and what we'll be outlining might need like another 30 seconds to a minute to outline um, whatever your case theory is, being like an open, fancy, not like an opening statement that might sort of summarise your entire your entire submission. Not too passionate, but something maybe a little bit like strong. Can be hard to get that without going over the top. Um, and then going through, I'll be addressing blah, blah, blah. My junior will be addressing blah, blah, blah. I am addressing. So that's what the only reason why they might speak a little bit longer. Yeah. Sign up, guys. It's the first criminal law one. It's gonna be really cool. I'm excited. So there's no other questions. You can, did I put my, no, I did not put my email address there. That's okay. Director.mootclub.qtwilson.com. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's it. Otherwise, just message the Facebook page or send an email. Um, and encourage your friends to give it a go. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if it's still recording. Yes, it's still recording.